everyone and welcome. So glad you're here joining us for this class presentation by Dana Frank. Um, in a moment, I'll be handing the mic over to Professor Carlos Aguirre, the director of the Center for Latino, Latina, and Latin American Studies. But first, I would like to ask everyone here to join me in acknowledging and honoring the fact that we are here on Kalapuya land. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, yes, my name is Carlos Aguirre, and I'm the interim director for uh, class. And I'm a professor of history here at the University of Oregon. I would like to start by uh, thanking the people that made this uh, event possible. Obviously, Dana, our uh, wonderful guest, but also Feather and Eli in the uh, class office who work really hard all the time to make these uh, events uh, possible. And also to uh, Lynn Steven and Gabriela Martinez, the former and current uh, director of class. I'm, I'm here just uh, for a few more weeks. So uh, uh, the organization of these started uh, long before. I'm really pleased to introduce to you uh, Dana Frank. She's a professor of history emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. For the last few decades, she has been a leading scholar of U.S. and Latin American labor history with research interests in working class history, banana workers in Latin America, and modern and contemporary Honduran history. She's the author of uh, numerous articles and books, including Bananeras, Women Transforming the Banana Unions of Latin America, published in 2005. Women Strikers, Occupy Chain Store, Wing Big, the 1937 Detroit Woolworth Sit Down, published in 2012, and most recently, The Lone Honduran Night, Resistance, Terror in the United States in the Aftermath of the Coup. On this uh, topic, she has also written uh, numerous op-eds in uh, outlets such as The Nation, The New York Times, The San Francisco Chronicle, and many others. This is certainly not the first time she is with us here. We were just uh, reminiscing about that. We both thought it was only a few years ago. <laughs> it's almost 20. <laughs> she was here in the spring of 2001, 18 actually, only 18. <laughs> um, she was spent here uh, a term at, uh, on the U of campus as the Wayne Moore Center Chair in Law and Politics. Her most recent book examines Honduras since 2009, since the 2009 coup that the post-democratic elected President Manuel Zelaya. Interweaving her personal experiences in post-coup Honduras and in the U.S. Congress with a larger analysis of the coup regime and its ongoing repression, Honduran opposition movements, U.S. policy in support of the regime, and congressional challenges to that policy, Dana Frank's book helps us understand the root causes of the immigrant caravans of Hondurans leaving for the U.S. and the destructive impact of U.S. policy. Please join me in welcoming Dana Frank. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everyone who worked on this, especially. Feather Crawford, thank you, the people who clean the room that we don't know, I assume they're union labor. Um, and um, thank you, um, the class, which is such an amazing institution. I want to thank Lynn Steven, who is not here, um, that helped me set this up with uh, Carlos. Um, thank you, Ellen Herman, who's in the back, of the colleague I know from way back. And Margaret Halleck, I want to thank and honor her work at the Waymore Center. I was here, um, like he said, in 2001, and I, I got this letter out of the blue saying, would you like to come teach at the University of Oregon as the Wayne Morris Chair of Law and Politics, and we'll buy shell rat and bring you up here for a quarter. And I, this is, I had such an amazing time, and I always say it was like being queen for a quarter, and here I get to be queen for 24 hours and speak in this beautiful library and have you all here. So I, I'm very, very gloriously happy to be back at the University of Oregon and, and also to be in Oregon. I drove up, and I'm like very happy. Um, and most of all, thank you all for coming and for caring about Honduras, which is a very difficult thing to care about. Even when you say the title of the book, it makes me cry. 
And um, what I'm going to do here is first talk a little bit about the book itself and who I am and how I came to write the book. And then I'm mostly going to talk about its content framed around the question of root causes of the caravans and why people are fleeing Honduras in such terror. And I know that's what you came here for and what you're thinking about. Um, and if I have time, it depends on if people start nodding off or leaving, but if I have time, I want to talk about something very new, which is Trump's threat to cut all aid to Honduras and the politics of that and where the money actually goes and whether we we want it cut or not, which is a complicated answer. Um, and then I'll also talk about what you can do. <laughs> so don't believe before that. So first, let me talk a little bit about who I am and the origins of the book. Um, as you could kind of tell from the introduction, I've mostly taught US history for most of my life, in particular US labor history, race and ethnicity, and social movements, and gender. And um, in 2001, right, actually 2000, right before I was here, I was invited to help work with the Coalition of Latin American Banana Unions to do some solidarity work. And um, it opened up a world for me of um, working in Honduras, working in the South, looking North, trying to build international solidarity on relations of equality. And as, par as part of that, I ended up writing a little book about women's projects in the banana unions of of Honduras in particular, and also throughout Latin America, and that book came out, I think, around 2005. And then I started doing another research project about the history of the labor movement in, in Honduras, and it had been about eight or nine years, and I was finishing the research on that, and I said, okay, it's hot and humid in Honduras, I can't handle the weather, I love my friends here, I'll keep coming back, but I'm gonna go work on coffee workers or broccoli workers or, or blueberry workers, now that I'm in Oregon, because, and um, I was sort of starting to check out, I hadn't been to Honduras for a year, and on June 28, 2009, at 5.30 in the morning, I got one of those phone calls that there had been a military coup, uh, and the democratically erected president of Honduras, Manuel Celaya, had been put on a plane very famously in his pajamas and shipped off by the military of Honduras to Costa Rica. And, um, Nobody saw that was coming. I certainly didn't. And my closest friend, Edith Munguia, who's sort of the heroine of the Banana Women book, was picked up by the military during a peaceful demonstration four days after the coup and thrown into the back of an open truck on top of 15 other people and detained. And when something like that happens to one of your closest friends, and she got out after about five hours, and you're trying to figure out what to do, it changes your life because it could have happened to anybody um, that I know in Honduras and people I know have been killed or their children have been killed to get to them. And I've got up every morning since that morning of the coup and said, what powers do I have to stop that? And that's part of why I'm here. Um, and it really meant I had a different life, both reporting on and writing about Honduras, but also being involved in solidarity work and being back and forth a lot. So most of what I did in the first couple of years was involved in solidarity work, sharing information, talking to journalists. I started writing uh, opinion articles for newspapers. I had them a very hard time anybody getting anything in from the progressive perspective the first two years, and then eventually got into the New York Times and got deeper into media and places like Foreign Affairs that would allow me to write for them, and started working with mainstream reporters. Um, and then after I did this for about five, uh, um, I've been doing that for many, many years. And then I also started in 2011 going to Congress and I bought, I'm from California, I'm Santa Cruz. I bought term little suits so I could go to Washington and I knocked on the Cong doors of Congress and figure it, crack the code of how to do that. And one of the chapters of the book is actually about people from the North and Hondurans working together in the US Congress and how we did that. And I actually gave away the playbook of how we did it so that other people could know that. Um, so what, I've been doing that and I've been writing by, by about 1980, by about seven or eight years into the coup, I had written I think about 35 different op-ed pieces, all of which sounded the same. Here's this horrible thing, here's the origins of it, here's why US is supporting it, here's why that's wrong, here's how Congress is pushing back, here's what we should do instead. And it was killing me as a writer. I had written a lot of books before, including some creative nonfiction and more narrative history, and I just, I, I said, I can't stand this anymore. So, and meanwhile, I'd had a lot of really intense experiences in Honduras, both reporting on things and also just trips and things I'd witnessed. So I started just writing stories as a creative process just to process things and because I wanted the literary outlet. Um, and eventually I put together, you know, a whole little baby collection of stories together with some pieces that I had written and published at the time when they happened. And, um, 
And then I'd sent them to a publisher and they said, oh, give us the big narrative. And I'm like, I don't want to write the big narrative. And I just sat on the, the stories for a year and then I decided I was ready to write the big narrative. So the book that you see is about a third my personal stories embedded in the larger picture of, of the, the, the coup, the repression, the resistance, U.S. policy and pushback against U.S. policy and the evolving nature of Honduran opposition. And the, in the first beginning of the book, you're very much in the story, in the streets with me as I'm report, interviewing people and talking to people. And, and then later on, there's it later in the book, I take you to Washington and then most of the time it's back in Honduras and then goes back and forth. Um, and it part of it is also because you can't, the policy stuff is so intense, you can't just read it unless you're in an undergraduate class that your professor is going to give you an exam on. And even then, it's rough reading this stuff. And also, it's a very terrible story in many ways. And I deliberately intersperse that with m more beautiful stories or of humor. Hondurans are very fun people that love to have, enjoy life, very Caribbean in their style. and. I wanted to capture that spirit of Hondurans in the stories as well. Um, so some of it is very um, tech, uh, weedy details about the State Department and U.S. policy. And you know, I spent my lifetime teaching about U.S. history and thinking critically about U.S. imperialism, but watching it happen in live time was incredible education and also watching the media politics in lifetime and what was and wasn't reported and by whom. But watching the State Department wiggle and lie and deceive was really astounding for me and I wanted the readers to see how that plays out in time and of course this is happening as we speak on an even, well shall we say, equally or more scary scale. Um, and some of it is also just um, things I'm doing that I'm just trying to have fun at a literary level. There's a section called Zero to Axe Murderers in 13 Minutes that is really part axe murder jokes and but it's partly about how I end up using the term axe murderers to try to capture what's going on out there and the 13 minutes is I have a meeting with a 24-year-old congressional aide who knows nothing about Latin America, and I have 13 minutes to get to the president of Honduras is an axe murderer. And, it's, and this, I'm not making this up, I just did this for two weeks. Um, um, so, uh, and the, uh, the last thing I wanna say is that the story, I did not intend in originally, this partly I'm telling you the origins of the book is, is that ultimately in the book, I am a main character in about a third of the book, and I wanna mark the fact that I'm a white middle class US citizen with a PhD and professor attached to my name which means I have all kinds of privileges and limits of what I can understand. That there's, I have to learn about a lot of things because I didn't experience them. I can walk back and course across that border and, and freely and come back into the United States, although I did just get busted by the Border Patrol in Nogales for having an American apple I was bringing back in, into the United States five years, and they wrote me up and took my passport number forever and ever. Um, so uh, it's an example of even with all my privileges, it's, it's not complete. But I just want to say that, there, that I want to say that this says I'm not Honduran. I, I, every word that every Honduran is in, who's in here um, approved what I said and all the quotes and they're in here with my permission, which is really important because it's dangerous, but it also protects them to be in the book in a very complicated game of risk and danger. Um, so let me just mark that and we could talk about how that shapes the book later if you're interested. So now let me just turn to the content of the book and my main argument. I think that um, we're used to reading about Honduras as what I myself came to call several years ago the river of horror and um, that it's this, this continuous river of dead bodies floating along full of terrible horror and repression. And the biggest thing I want to say is that that is river of horror, which is very real, has always been balanced with activism and joy and joy and struggle and joy in daily life. It is not just a story of unrelenting horror and it's part of the victim narrative we get fed up here that everybody is just a passive victim, that the erasure of the way people seize life and seize activism and build alternatives. Hundreds are not just suffering victims, which is the media story you get most of the time and they don't necessarily all want the United States to go down there and rescue them after being responsible for so much. Um, and I think that the caravans dialogue in the last year, the caravan under the caravans underscore that people are always looking for new strategies to be able to survive and even flourish. So in that framework, I want to talk about two parts. One is 
the narrative of what, why people are leaving. And I'm sure you're thinking in your head that the narrative is that people are leaving gangs, violence, and poverty. Gangs, violence, and poverty. And that is absolutely true. They're fleeing gangs, violence, and poverty. That's not the only thing they're fleeing. But what you don't hear is that that situation is not a natural disaster. It is not a natural disaster. It's a product of policies of the Honduran government and the US government backing that up and keeping them in power. And I think there's a racist narrative that goes way back to the 1890s and the US invasion of the Philippines, and, uh, which is that, that the, the little brown people out there can't govern themselves. And the, the little brown, <laughs> the, and that this racist notion that somehow people in Central America have a natural tendency to, to chaos. And it's the opposite. It's really the beautiful history of democracy and alternative visions, and the US keeps intervening and intervening. And I would also say, and you'll see by the end, the argument I'm going to make is that they are also refugees, and they're refugees from US policy. So first, let me talk about violence and gangs and that piece of that, because the violence and gangs are not random. They're embedded in the very top levels of the Honduran government, the top levels of the military and the police. It's not something that's a few bad apples or something that's going on at the bottom. As I said before, in 2009, on June 28th, so we're almost up on 10 years um, on June 28th, there was this military coup in cahoots with the majority of Congress and the Supreme Court that deposed democratically elected President Manuel Celaya, who was a more or less a centrist. He'd been tilting a little bit into more progressive directions, but he came from one of two elite right-wing parties that had ruled the country along with 13 elite families for decades. And when the coup happened, um, it threw the rule of law out the window altogether. You know, the concept of the rule of law was not something that I had in my vocabulary at all before this. And of course, it's something we're starting to understand with the Trump administration about what, what is constitutional order and the rule of law means and why we need to be very committed to it because we're seeing it I mean, eroded as we speak here as well. So that meant that the judicial system was just out the window and corruption just flourished in the, in the, among judges, among the prosecutors, in the attorney general's office. The police, the corruption spread to as much as probably 70 to 75 percent of all police throughout the military, much of Congress. It's not like there was a golden age in Honduras before the coup. It was poor. These 13 families owned most of it. But there was a functioning state and a functioning economy, and the coup opened the door to rampant criminality. The murder rate shot, you may have remembered, in 2012, shot to the highest, 2011, to the highest in the world. Um, that means that there's a 95% impunity rate as well. And impunity means you get off with it. So you can kill anybody you want, and nothing will happen to you. And that's still very much true today. Um, and the murder rate remains among the highest in the world. The Honduran government and the US State Department will say it's been cut in half. But the only statistics we have are from the Honduran government itself, which started doing various things for propaganda purposes to make it look like things are getting better. For example, and somebody from the UN recently confirmed this with a senator that was down there recently, um, that the Honduran government doesn't count so-called violent deaths. And among violent deaths, as opposed to homicides, they, don't, they, they count bodies found in plastic bags and bodies found in unmarked mass graves, which litter the Honduran landscape, okay? So I'll give you one way in which they even admit they're manipulating the murder statistics. In this context, gangs that had been present before and started in Los Angeles and, and, were that, um, and proliferated inside the prison system in Southern California when the US had racist criminal justice policies that then locked a young, let young Central American youth up in Los Angeles and then deported them back to Central America and often don't, they didn't even speak Spanish and no one would hire them. The gangs then spread very viciously throughout Honduras as well as Guatemala and El Salvador. The gangs kill people, all the stories that you've read in the media about the gang came and you, you, know, and I, you see these stories over and over again, interview with people in the caravan. The gangs killed my sister, they killed my son, they killed my husband, I took the last remaining kids and got out of there as fast as I could. And about every two weeks I get a request to be an expert witness in an um, asylum case. And I can tell you it's just over and over and over again, and it's not random gangs, it's gangs in cooperation with the police. Um, the police are also very tied in with extortion by the gangs. And this is important when we start looking at solutions because one of the things that the gangs and the police together have done is destroy small businesses. And because the gangs come around and they say, we're on Tuesday and say we're gonna come around on Saturday and every Saturday 
and you're going to pay X amount. And they say this to the cab drivers, they say to the bus drivers, they say it to small businesses all over the country. And if you don't pay, you're killed. It's not an idle threat. For example, I know um, a small business owner that for many, many years, for 20 years down there, and um, the gangs came around about f four years ago and said, hi, you're going to pay this. And a woman who's a vegetable seller, um, like a half a block down street seller, said no, and they came around and shot her up in the streets and her two children right there in the middle of the street. Um, about a couple months later, my friend's very good friend, the barber, two blocks away, paid the extortion and filed a police report and two weeks later the gangs came and killed him, shot him up in his, in his, in his barber shop. It was all on video, nobody was ever arrested for many years. And uh, you can see there he reported the police then, the gangs came and killed him for doing that. Around, and then the police and the military say, oh, it's a big brouhaha, and so it's like, hello, we're gonna protect people, we have these people, police and military teams patrolling the streets, you can see them in pairs. And um, this is about a year and a half ago, this old man around the store, around the corner, CD seller, had a CD store, I used to buy my CDs there, and um, he put his arm on the hand of the woman that came around to collect and said, I'm an old man, I'm tired of this, I don't wanna pay, I don't wanna do this, and then paid her. And um, uh, that weekend, the police and military disappeared from the streets for two days, someone came and killed the old man, and the police and military returned the next day. And this is all in a place where I, you know, I go and sit, look at me, I sit in a chair in front of the store everywhere I'm down, every time I'm down there, protect my friend. This is happening all over the country. Um, people start small businesses, and then if they start expanding into another area, the gangs come and collect from that area too. And I just was on Congress walk, uh, visiting offices with a Honduran doctor who's very, Honduran middle class and he had a cousin that had a small business that was thriving and then three different gang groups wanted her to pay and she said look I'll pay in my territory but not over there and the guy from the air that Terry said I know where your daughter goes to school her 11 year old daughter see she's and they sold the house sold the business left for Spain the next day right because they, they when they threaten they, they do it so the point I want to make here is that the gangs aren't just happening the gangs are interlocked with the police so, and the U.S. is funding those police, and I'll come back to that. The military is the other big piece of this, and the Honduran military are very tied in with the president, and they are very involved in drug trafficking, particularly cocaine, and they use government helicopters and um, planes, and the Associated Press has documented that, and they move cocaine over the borders, and they also then claim that they're stopping the drug traffickers. The current minister of security, who was a former very high-ranking general when he was put in charge of the security, is, has twice been named in U.S. federal court as, a, as overseeing drug trafficking flights. The top three directors of the police, named a year ago, this is not a long time ago, or have been documented by Associated Press to be overseeing cocaine shipments. And none of them have been suspended. Nobody's been fired. They're all still up there running the police and the security apparatus. And, um, and the present, the most recent was in November, some of you may have seen this, the president of Honduras is a man named Juan Orlando Hernandez, and he's known as Juan Orlando. There's lots of people named Hernandez, and Juan Orlando is a compound first name, and he has a brother named Tony. And Tony was arrested in Miami of last year and charged with being a major top cartel leader and arms trafficker in Honduras. He was also a Congress member. Now, nobody in their right mind thinks that the president didn't know his brother was involved in this, oh, but, and also let the attorney general had to have known, the minister of security known, that had to have known, the top of the police had to have known, and of course the U.S. military and the U.S. government has to have known this at all, and many people have also fingered the president himself. So when we hear about violence shooting up, a lot of it is the gangs people killing people who don't cooperate. A lot of it is drug traffickers killing each other, killing people who won't carry something they want, killing people who won't cooperate. The other big piece of the violence is domestic violence, which has really shot up. People talk about femicides, and women are killed in all kinds of domestic violence situations. And because, and if you, you can kill anybody you want and nothing will happen to you for most anybody. So that's why when you hear that people are fleeing the violence, it's really important to see that there are state policies behind this and behind the impunity. The attorney general who's supposed to be holding up the rule of law for the whole country just accepted an illegal 
reappointment last July in the middle, at, on a Friday night. I was there. He wasn't even a candidate. And he, it was the previous attorney general. And suddenly the Congress voted him in as attorney general when he wasn't even legally a candidate. And he's supposed to uphold the rule of law. He's been sitting on all kinds of evidence about you name it. And so like, and, and I could tell you more examples about the attorney general, but it's really important to see that it's the top levels of the state. It's not just a few bad apples. The second reason people are fleeing is poverty, and this is also very real, but again, you have to see it as having been constructed. It's not just natural disaster. Um, the coup itself, because it threw out the rule of law, destroyed the investment climate. So even if you're thinking of this in terms of supporting transnational corporations or supporting businesses, I, I don't think most of us think we would want business investment of some kind to keep the Honduran economy alive in this crisis situation. But, the, but the, if you don't have the rule of law, you don't get international investment. Because if you can't have your property protected, you know, it's just a simple level. There's no judicial system, no functioning police. People are not going to invest. But they also don't invest because the, the elites that run the government are so corrupt, they just rob. And somebody who is pretty much co very connected in the Honduran elites told me about two years ago that she knew some major corporations in Europe that wanted to invest big time in Europe and um, didn't because the Honduran government turned them down, or, the or their Honduran partners turned them down because the Honduran end of it didn't want transparency requirements so that they, because they wanted to be able to steal money off those investments. And right, so that's why they turned down big European investments because the Europeans weren't going to let them steal money, skim a lot of it off the top and off the bottom. Um, the other thing that is important to mark here, and this is tricky when we're going to start when we talk about where the aid goes, is that a lot of what gets called development or economic growth or development is actually destroying good livelihoods all over Honduras, and this has been going on for ten years, and it's accelerating. Um, those sectors that are seen as development, marked as development under something called the Alliance for Prosperity, but for example, funded by the United States. Uh, the biggest one, one of the biggest ones is palm oil. And how many of you have a feel for palm oil production? It's very big all over the world, and um, it's seen as this benevolent thing. And it actually is really, really destructive environmentally. It sucks up the water table. And these elite, two elite families in particular have been planting palm oil all over Honduras. And the richest man in the country, who was one of the biggest backers of the coup, a man named Miguel Facuse, who died two years ago, um, has this, a private army of 200 that has worked with the police and the military, and this is all documented, to force Campesino uh, agriculture collectives off land that they were settled on through agrarian reform in the 70s and 80s, forcing them off the land. About 150 Campesinos have been killed in the last um, several years in this process, and then replanting that land with palm oil creates very few jobs and forces these campesinos off the land at the point of a gun, and this is part of the river of horror. Um, another big example is tourism. The tourism, the big corporate and elite tourism development projects, or the planned ones, are along the Caribbean coast where there's beautiful beaches, and a lot of that land is owned by the Garifana people, who are Afro-indigenous people that have settled on that land. They were um, escaped slaves that lived on the island of Belize and intermarried with indigenous people of South America. They have their own language and culture. And they have fishing villages all along there, as well as farming farmlands. And the palm oil producers and the tourist developers have been repressing them and in some places killing them and, take, and doing all kinds of fraudulent things, the courts, to force the garifin of people off their land. And then you're like, oh, look, this is development, right? Tourism. Um, the most famous is probably hydroelectric dams. And this is about um, building a long-term strategy um, not only to make money off of building dams, but to generate energy that's going to go to the United States and Canada. And how many of you heard of Berta Cáceres? Can you stick your hands up? Okay, Berta Cáceres was a very, very famous indigenous and environmental activist in Honduras. And she and her Lenca people have been involved for many years trying to stop a dam on the Gualcarque River, which is the sacred lands of her people. And this dam that, that, by a company called Desa is, would destroy the whole river and that whole area. She got 33 thefts that she reported to the government and nothing ever happened. And on March 2nd, 2016, that's three, a little over three years ago, she was assassinated in her home and um, 
eight, eight men were charged, seven have actually been convicted, and among those included the National Director of Military Intelligence and someone else formerly from the military and the Chief of Security for the Dam Company. But the in, so-called intellectual authors of her assassination are still free, and that can include a member of one of the most elite families, the Vice President of Congress, and a series of other top political elite figures that are still free in her killing, but she became this international symbol, her face has moved around the world, sort of like Che Oedas, because she symbolizes this indigenous and people's resistance to these, these hydroelectric dam projects and dams all over the country. The other piece of that is mining. You know, every, t you know, every time we get a new cell phone or a new computer, there's mining inputs that are destroying indigenous lands and the environment all over the world. And there are, um, excuse me, 30% of the entire country has mining concessions granted since the coup. That's 30% of the whole country has mining concessions. And there was just a study that said 65% of all communities have some kind of a local mining concession. That means that some elites have some mining project with or without a legal license, often on indigenous lands. And there's a lot of struggles going on very locally in which people are being jailed and killed as they peacefully protest these mining incursions. Um, you know, the other big piece of the economy is the maquiladora sector, which is a thriving apparel factory. So there's about 130, 140,000 apparel workers, and that's where a lot of our clothes come from, therefore export. And, but they only do hire people in the formal economy, but, um, they don't, but they only hire very young people who then their eyesight goes bad and their lungs go bad because they're breathing cotton dust and looking at sewing machine all day, every day. And that's the most official formal sector, although there's some good news on that front in terms of union organizing. The last piece of the economy I'll talk about then is also is the state. Because here, you know, we used to, in the United States, we think we have some kind of a functional state. And what Honduras had, a, it wasn't a big welfare state. But at the time of the coup, it had a, fun, a mildly functioning state. And what's happened with the coup is the state has just been robbed blind. The biggest, the two biggest examples of this are at the time of the coup, there were these really, really strong teachers unions that had built up millions of dollars in pension funds for tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of workers. In the first three months after the coup, the entire teacher's pension fund was robbed. No one knows where it went, okay? Just like that, there's a single example. And you can multiply this times agency after agency. In fact, there's been a series of investigative stories in a publication called El Confidencial, if you want to read it, just in the last month. They said that the president and his brother and his wife and their allies, that each member of Congress from the ruling party got a government agent to rob, agency to rob. They, you know, like you just, there was an NGO set up your name, the money you've transferred over, and there's a former vice president of the Congress that says, I, she protested it, they set up this count in her name, she never signed the papers, she protested it, she says she got death threats from the president when she objected to that, which shows you how complex the system is. The most famous corruption is, it was revealed in 2015. And the, and the journalist named David Romero, who's in jail for 10 years as of a week ago for character defamation because of this case, okay? Shows you about repression of similarities and the dissent, too. And he revealed in 2015 that the president, the current president, Juan Orlando Hernandez, and the ruling party had stolen as much as $90 million from the National Health Service to pay for his 2013 campaign. And Heather, Heather, where are you? Heather was there in Honduras at the time, if you're interested in, in, that, in that, whole elect, that particular election. Um, and um, and the, the government, the attorney general, the same attorney general, admitted that the documents are real. And that led to the bankrupting of the National Health Service. And Honduras had a pretty good system of government hospitals that were free or people paid taxes into. They paid taxes into them for their employees too. Middle class people as well as working class people in the formal economy, use them. As many as 3,000 people died in that first year, 2013-14, when the, the system went bankrupt. There are still not enough dialysis machines. Doctors and nurses don't get paid. It's a total massive national health healthcare disaster. That money went to the president and to the ruling party in 2013, and nobody has gone to jail. There are some people going to jail for fit selling fake pharmaceuticals and things like that. Um, so what this means is that the, the state services have been destroyed. Multiply that times every agency, and you can get a feel for what's going on. There are also privatizations, and privatizations this is partly why the coup 
was perpetrated against Manuel Celaya because he was trying to stop some of these privatizations, which means that the government has sold off the National Telephone Company, the National Electrical Company, sold them off to elites, broken them up into several bodies, then they steal the money, and then, the, then suddenly now the electrical company doesn't work. Every day in the Honduran papers you see a headline, these are the parts of the country that won't have electrical power today. <laughs> you know, and, and then it goes bankrupt, and now the Inter-American Development Bank from the United States just gave $10 million to Honduras, partly for the police and partly to bail out the electrical company. Right? So they steal it, and then the US bails it out, and then I whack the, the microphone. Um, so, and you can, and also sometimes whole government agencies, most recently the youth vocational offices, they'll just eliminate a government office with eight or 10,000 workers over and over and over again to get rid of a strong union that was fighting corruption or fighting for workers' rights. And so when you have, the result of this is you don't have functioning state services, and you have hundreds of thousands of government jobs that were obliterated by the government, but also at the behest of the International Monetary Fund and multilateral development banks. Because the IMF, when the Honduran government went, started going bankrupt after stealing so much money, they've been bailing out the Honduran government into hundreds of thousands. And there's a quote in my book, and this is about four years ago, where, where the International Monetary Fund in their executive committee meeting said, we're helping the Honduran government lower their wage costs. Okay, we're helping or lower their wage bill. And that means they're laying people off and cutting their wages. And we're helping the Honduran government. Now, I, I looked up in December, I was looking at the most recent things, and they changed their language last year to, we're helping the Honduran government right size their wage bill. <laughs> now, there's like government bureaucracy speak. I don't think it means that they're atoning for their sins, right? Um, so, when, if you add all this up, um, you can see that it's not, again, not a natural disaster. It's policies of the Honduran government, it's thievery by the elites, and it's with the support of the United States government. So people, yes, are fleeing violence and poverty, but they're a result of state and economic policies and the corruption of the security forces. So let me just then talk about the United States and then I'll talk about resistance to all this. When the coup happened, we don't have the smoking gun that said the U.S. green-lighted the coup. We do know that Zelaya, the plane was Zelaya that took him out of the country, 100 military planes stopped at Sotocano Air Force Base at Palmarola, which is famously the base that the U.S. ran the Contra War against the Sandinistas in the 1980s. And most people think that the U.S. would not have allowed that plane to leave, to take off again with the president leaving the country if, it, if the US had not approved of that. But we do know, and you can see the evidence of my book, and you can read in a library, you don't have to buy it, <laughs> but um, is that the US green, uh, what did everything it could to stabilize the coast coup regime. And this is under Obama, and Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State. And a lot of people up here were thrown off because they thought maybe Obama was gonna be liberal, or at least not so bad, and it, and it was, Obama basically handed Latin America over to Hillary Clinton and the State Department, and she catches it for it, but let's remember it's Obama who she worked for. And Hillary Clinton did everything she could to make it so that both, both government, both the deposed president and the de facto dictator after the coup were treated as equals. So instead of saying Zelaya has to be restored immediately, that's the only condition here, this is an illegal coup, she said, let's negotiate. And they and basically, and you can see it in her emails, also a guy named Thomas Shannon, who was the real architect behind this at the State Department, um, you can see it in the emails, they played out time until the coup was in June and there was a regularly scheduled election on November 28th at the end of Zelaya's term. And they played out time until that election to settle. And as she put it in her autobiography years later, the elections rendered the question of Zelaya's return moot. Right? It solved it for us, in other words. And she says that in, now, she said in the hardback edition, edition and, and there was so much outrage over it, she took it out of the paperback edition. Okay. You know, she also, I don't have time to digress about this, she also told the New York Post in an interview that it, was, that, that it wasn't a coup. This is years later, she even backtracked and said we never called it a coup, which was not true. And at which point I went on Democracy Now! and said she's baldly lying. And you can get 120,000 hits on YouTube to that. Um, so, um, my moment of, my 15 minutes of fame. So the U.S., but it's not just the coup that the U.S. has green-lighted, it's green-light after green-light after green-light. Um, when Juan Orlando Hernandez, the current president, I'll tell you a little bit about him, he, and he's this very dangerous Machiavellian figure who comes from a military background. 
And at the time of the coup, he was a member of a congressional committee that approved the coup illegally. In 2012, he was the president of Congress in Honduras, and he led something called the technical coup, in which four out of five members of the constitutional part of the Supreme Court, and they, they have more members of the Supreme Court, but the other parts are like appeals courts. So the constitutional part, which is like our Supreme Court, four out of five of those members, he deposed them while he was president of Congress at three in the morning and named new justices the next day, completely illegally. The one who was not deposed was Oscar Chinchilla, who soon after became our friend, the Attorney General, and which gives you a sense of how what's going on down there. Um, that new Supreme Court, then, then he ran for president in 2013 campaign on a, excuse me, campaign, 2013 on a campaign of a soldier on every corner, saying that the military, this new militarization would protect people against the corrupt police. And then the military police and the military police started killing people with impunity. Okay, so then in 2017, the Honduran Constitution says really clearly that no sitting president can run for re-election or, or vice president can run for re-election or even advocate running for re-election, okay? It's like ironclad, and it's just like our Constitution. You have to go through a years-long amendment process to change it. So that same Supreme Court that Juan Orlando named in the technical coup said, well, you know, in the case that someone else brought, well, you know what? That, that uh, consti our Constitution violates international human rights norms, therefore it doesn't apply anymore, okay? And the U.S. says, okay, whatever you want down there. The official green light from the United States saying, you can follow your democratic processes however you choose. And um, so then Juan Orlando ran for president completely illegally in violation of the Constitution. In response to that, there, I'll, talk a more, there, there's an, I'll talk a little more about this in a sec, but there's a new center-left opposition party called Libre, the first center-left party in Honduran history. And they ran against Juan Orlando in coalition with a man named Salvador Nasralla, who is sort of a, a, sort of a loose cannon from the center, maybe even center-right newscaster, but had created something called the Anti-Corruption Party that was middle-class people and centrists seriously opposed to Juan Orlando Hernandez. So in order to get rid of Juan Orlando, they all, there was this giant coalition of everybody, almost everybody in the country, except the people that get patronage jobs from the ruling party and the ruling government. So um, the night of the elections, this is in November of 2017, so not this one before, um, the computer, the, the, everybody's watching television with 57% of the vote coming in. The Electoral Commission says that Nasrallah is way ahead by like eight, point, eight points or something, and the one independent member of the Electoral Commission says the rest of the results are consistent with that. And people had about three hours to think that democracy would come and Juan Orlando would be deposed through democratic processes. And what happens? The government, electoral commission shut down the, the commission, the, the, let's put this in the passive voice, the computers shut down, okay? The computers stopped working for two days and over the course of the next two weeks, the results were announced 5% at a time until lo and behold, Juan Orlando won by 1.5% and the U.S. recognized him. Okay, just like that, like clockwork. Um, and, it's, and as a friend of mine put it, the Honduran people reacted with rage and grief. And for those of us, I know I'm nodding out here, those of us who lived through it, and you know, Heather was talking about even 2013, it's quite probable that Zelaya's wife, Xiomara Castro, who was the opposition candidate, won. She was ahead in the polls, and then suddenly Juan Orlando won. But this time it was very clear, and unbelievable what it was like to experience that moment of hope that was dashed. And people poured into the streets peacefully and blockaded roads to say this is not, a, you cannot come to power, this is not legitimate. And the military and police responded by using live bullets against protesters and bystanders for the first time. And I think it's actually the first time since the 1930s and 40s. And clearly command came from up above the military and police to do that on the same day. It wasn't just a few rogue cops and military, and 22 people at least were killed. According to the UN statistics, all of those people who killed them are impunity. Just two weeks ago, somebody was arrested for the first time after the UN protested again. Um, and so it's really important to see, again, you can see this top collusion and this kind of repression of democratic alternatives. So the U.S. continues to support Juan Orlando. The money is still flowing. We'll talk about the money at the end. But also, the U.S. also doesn't just fund Juan Orlando. It legitimates it and celebrates him. Most of you know who John Kelly is, right? John Kelly was Juan, was Juan Orlando's. Juan was Donald Trump's 
chief of staff for a couple of years there. Before that, he was briefly head of Homeland Security. But before that, he was head of, he's a Marine, a general in the military. He was head of the United States Southern Command for two or three years before that, which means he oversaw all the US forces in that region, including Honduras. And he went down there all the time. You can see a great picture of him smiling at Juan Orlando in my book. And he said repeatedly that Juan Orlando was doing an impressive job in fighting drugs. When he was head of Homeland Security, he said Juan Orlando is a great guy and is a good friend. I'm not making this up. And again, AP did a great story last April about what Juan Orlando, what Kelly must have known about Juan Orlando. Um, and so you can also see the collusion of the US military with this. Um, but also, it just goes on and on. I mean, until like, we tell Trump's thing about two weeks ago, John Bolton and, and also, who's the, um, national security advisor to Trump and also the head of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the State Department. She, they were down in Honduras and congratulated, um, congratulated Juan Orlando as a great partner and a collaborator of, of the United States. So, um, and then so the, and also how the U.S. has looked the other way at the rest of Juan Orlando's brother. So then we get to this big question, why is the United States doing this? And we can talk about this more later. And I, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and talking about it, um, and it's, a lot of it is big geopolitical strategic things, especially you can see more clearly now with this um, sort of nationalistic or imperialistic revival of new Cold War rhetoric against China and Russia and Iran, as if, if the United States didn't dominate Latin America, somebody else would, and there's no alternative of actual sovereignty for a Latin American country. And this goes back to the Monroe Doctrine in, from the United States, which decided on its own, without talking to Latin Americans, that Latin, the, the hemisphere belongs to the United States and nobody else can come in there. Well, how about the United States doesn't go into the rest of, you know, so these basic sovereignty issues and imperialism that are built into, um, into the US dominant political culture but why does the U.S. care? Because it's also then you get into making the hemisphere and the world safe for transnational corporate investments. It's not as simple as in the 50s where the U.S. intervenes and in, overthrows the government of Guatemala to protect United Fruit, whose, whose lawyer was the Secretary of State and his, another lawyer was the head of the CIA. It's much more a generic, about a generic platform for resource extraction, for energy extraction, for apparel production, for you name it. The U.S. does not, has not until recently, has lot, had locked down lot strategic allies in Latin America. Because when democracy came to Latin America in the 90s and 2000s and the military governments were thrown out, people voted in progressive uh, governments in Argentina, in Chile, in Venezuela, in Ecuador, eventually in El Salvador, um, in Bolivia, and the so-called pink tide, which is now being very dramatically pushed back. And um, the U.S. was losing that domination that it had, and Zelaya in Honduras was the weakest link in that chain. And so the coup, which is was sort of a message about what's happening now, which is the U.S. promoting regime change in Venezuela and Nicaragua. Um, there's also, I've been trying to understand, there's um, the military as an engine that runs of itself, the U.S. military. And I, it's, because I, I tend to think of it as U.S. government X, and it's actually more contradictory and complicated than that. But um, Kelly, for example, has admitted to saying things simply because he could get more money for the Southern Command that way out of Congress. Because um, about, about four years ago, he said, when the Ebola, remember Ebola? He said, out of the blue, there was no Ebola in Central America. If Ebola comes, to, this is about the time of the migration crisis, so-called, in 2014. If Ebola comes to Central America, it'll be Katie Barr, the barn doors. And I don't, that's his phrase, okay? He said this to the Atlantic Council at a big speech. And he meant, like, we're gonna have to put up a big wall, which is, of course, what we're hearing now. But then he admitted at a human rights roundtable that somebody I know is at in Washington, that he'd only said that because he wanted to get more money, in part. And so then you sort of see that the, 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 the threats are created in order in for, to have uh, money for entities that want money. So let me finally just talk about the resistance to all this and to what you can do. And then like, if we have time, we can talk about the aid. I'll talk about the aid. Because when in this narrative that we're familiar with in the US media, it's, that it's an unrelenting horror and everybody's a suffering victim, but they're also passive and don't have their own notions of democracy, so we have to go in and rescue them and help them. And what disappears from this is this long and incredibly beautiful and brave and huge 
history of collective activism and resistance in Honduras since the coup. And the first stage of this was the National Front of Popular Resistance, which was this huge and amazing coalition of you know, as many as a million people of the labor movement, the women's movement, the LGBT movement, the campesino movement, the Afro-Indigenous movement, indigenous people's movements, the campesinos, human rights groups, middle class people committed to the rule of law, the Jesuits, you name it. And hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. When Zelayat was allowed to return to the country in 2011, the mainstream right-wing papers said there were between 900,000 and 1.2 billion people went to a march to welcome him back in a country that had about 8.5 million at the time. So like one in eight people, okay, in a demonstration. And that's just the people who would be brave enough to go to demonstration. And people really poured into the streets and protested this for two years. And many, many, many people died uh, because of this. And there's a lot more that are in exile. In 2013, 2011, um, uh, President Zelai was allowed to return, and a, a, a part of the resistance turned, created a, a opposition party of the center left called Libre, or Libertad y Refundación. Libre is what it's called, and they turned and they started running electoral campaigns. And there'd never been a center left party in Honduran history. A tiny, tiny one called the UDE, but they got with maybe three, four percent before that. In the elections of 2013, Xiomara Castro, their president. I think probably won. Again, she was ahead in the polls up until a month before, and they don't, they don't allow polls in the last month. But we don't really know. We do know that Libre got the second number of members, uh, the second largest percentage of Congress, but they never had enough to be the majority. So the other right wing party has been, was ruling after that, along with the ruling party, the National Party. But certainly there's this long history that's still very much there. Um, three, at least three of people in the caravans in the last year have been former Libre members of Congress fleeing because of poverty and death threats. So, I mean, and, and people carry signs in the first, a lot of the caravans last spring that say Fuera Ho and J-O-H is the initials of the president. It's like F-D-R. And Fuera means get out. And they carry signs in Fuera Ho and the Fuera Ho uh, slogan comes from another movement in 2015. And when it was revealed by David Romero, the journalist, that all that money had been stolen from the National Health Service, middle class people all over the country organized something called, a movement called the Indignados, or Outrage Ones. And on Friday nights, they started carrying torches, lit like tiki torches, like we have in a backyard party, that, that, um, and they started carrying them to represent the people that had died. And they got bigger and bigger until the, I saw the two biggest ones in the capital, but they were all over the country, with 75,000 people in these marches. And I can tell you, I've seen marches with a million people, and this is the most beautiful thing I ever saw, because there was a boulevard in the middle of um, Tegucigalpa, and you, and you were in the march, and you went over this overpass, and you could see in the dark the torches as far as you can see filling the boulevard in every direction. The people in the Indignados, for the most part, were middle class people, that had, a lot of whom had supported the coup, that came from the traditional right wing parties, but had had enough with corruption, and also they were losing their health care, and they were paying taxes for their employees' health care, and they were protesting too against this level of corruption. If you're wondering, how do I know they're middle class? If I've been, I've been a lot of during demonstration of the resistance, and everybody was wearing black and white, and had very sleek hairdos, and very avant-garde glasses, and there are class cultural markers, although lots and lots of other people joined these marches because they want to protest Juan Orlando too. And also, they knew that any future also depends on the middle class people fighting, who would fight corruption. Um, you never know any of this history from the US press. You would never know that there are opposition Congress members. You would never know the guy who, the journalist is in jail for revealing about those checks. You would never know the, about the indignados. You would never know that all over the country there are beautiful and brave indigenous people's protests against mining projects that are being repressed as we speak because it doesn't fit the victim narrative, right? It doesn't fit the narrative that something's terrible or that we should go down and rescue them. Um, and again, if the other big moment was when the election was stolen and all those people that poured into the streets and so many people were killed. Um, and this is still going on. The people that actually are paying attention, thanks to a national grassroots movement and also the Honduran people, is the US Congress. But here's another piece of this that you would never know from the mainstream media. In 2000, there have been many, many letters of members of Congress and pressure from Congress, Democrats, 
on the Secretary of State and the President saying cut police and military aid to Honduras. At one point in 2013-14, 94 members of the House signed a letter saying cut police and military aid to Honduras, which you probably don't even know that. There's something called the Berta Cáceres Human Rights in Honduras Act. How many people have heard of that one? Okay, and it was inter first introduced in Mar uh, June of 2000 and 16, and it calls for a suspension of U.S. police and military to aid Honduras, and it also says that the U.S. has to vote no on all multilateral development bank loans to the Honduran security forces, because they get almost as much money that way as they do through the regular U.S. appropriations process. There were 71 members of the House on it last year. Nobody ever tells you that. It was just reintroduced a week and a half ago with 48 members, original co-sponsors, I think maybe 40, 44 original co-sponsors is now up to 49. Pete DeFazio, Suzanne Bonamici, and um, Rob Blumenauer are all on it. They've all been on it for years. Kurt Schrader is not. So you want, if anybody is in Kurt Schrader's disc, and you want to thank those pe people that I named for being on it and tell them to get other members on it. Because it's HR 1945, and the text is still, because there's so many new bills being introduced in Congress right now, the, 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 the people that typeset the bill, it was introduced, but you can't see it online yet, but keep watching, it's HR 1945, and you can look it up, but you can see the list of the co-sponsors there. Um, I just spoke to the Progressive Caucus about it two weeks ago, and that's very interesting. The power of the Progressive Caucus is huge. I'm happy to say there are 97 members of the Progressive Caucus out of, what, 238, 240 uh, members, Democratic members of the House. And so it's very, very interesting what's going on about that. Um, now, there is no Berta Cáceres Act in the, House, in the Senate, and one of the key people who a lot of people have been talking to about introducing it is, is Senator Jeff Merkley, who cares about Honduras. He was the only senator that called for a new election in 2017. He was just down there, and when he was down there, he said some things he shouldn't have. He, got, he said that the, he got sort of bamboozled or whatever by the Honduran government and the embassy, and he came out saying that, they, that the people who organized the caravans should be prosecuted, investigated and prosecuted, which is the Honduran government's line, and that of the State Department. So that was really sad, and his tweets were really weak. He was good on Guatemala, and in opposition to that, he then tweeted about the anniversary of Berta's death. But it's like really important if we're gonna get leadership in the Senate. I um, mean, you guys are lucky because you happen to be in the state of somebody who is probably, along with Senator Ben Cardin, well, the most important potential person to lead on this. Senator Patrick Lady of Vermont is awesome. He is this is power through the appropriations process and has put conditions on aid to Honduras for many years, but um, the State Department always certifies that those conditions has met, been met and then the money gets released anyway. Um, um, so what, let me just end with the question of um, the aid right now, because I know a lot of, I think, how many of you know that a week and a half ago Trump announced that all the aid to Central America should be cut? Okay, and this was like a punishment thing. They, stop, they won't stop their people from coming, therefore I'm not gonna give them a cent, okay? And he sort of threatened us in the fall. Now, let me tell you, he did that the day after the Berta Caceres Act was introduced. But that, in turn, has prompted a huge wave of give them their money, give them even more money. Ranging from liberals to the far right including two days ago, five former heads of the Southern Command of the U.S. military, which give you a signal about the complexity of what that money is going to and how we shouldn't have a knee-jerk response that give them the money, don't cut the money, and give them even more money. Because one conversation we haven't had is about where that aid money goes. And that conversation is happening now, and there's not a lot of information. So first of all, there's, the, uh, there's $181 million that's still not been dispersed from 2017 and, um, and eight, uh, 18 to Honduras. I'm just talking about Honduras here, and we can bracket Guatemala and El Salvador who are also um, included in that. First, where does it go? First of all, it doesn't go to poor Honduran people directly for the most part. It goes to defense contractors who sell 
planes and helicopters. It goes to people making a lot of money in Washington who go down there and run programs. Most of the money, it goes to agricultural interests in the United States who then are interlocked with, with export dependencies, import complicated agricultural policies in Honduras. And so it's not like it's the money, most of the money even goes to the Honduran people. And I want to underscore that. Um, in fact, I had a 45-minute conversation with one of Merkley's wonderful aides about where the money goes. Um, um, and um, one end of the spectrum, if I, I actually went into and looked at the data about a, few, uh, about a week ago, um, a big, about a quarter to a third of the money goes to the military and the police. That's what we want suspended until human rights address, okay? It's, um, and that includes, and if you look at what's it for, it's for fighting the drug war. Okay, well, first of all, the notion that drug war should be militarized has led to the killing of a, at least 250,000 people in Mexico. But even if you, that was your goal to fight drugs, we're working with the drug traffickers. Okay, that is, so I think I've convinced you of that. You can, when the bill is posted, you can see the evidence for that in the bill as well. And the other thing that this military money and police money goes to is border security, quote unquote. So what is the border security money going for? Stopping drugs from coming in and out of the country when the military and the police are moving, the border patrol are moving the drugs themselves. And the border patrol is stopping Hondurans from leaving their own country. Okay, it's stop, our funds are stopping Hondurans from, and it's a constitutional right to leave your country by the Honduran constitution. They're stopping Hondurans and they use dogs. Okay, and there's a citation for that in my book if you're interested. And you know, it's interesting, there was a hearing with um, Secretary of State Pompeo yesterday, and Tom Malinowski, who's a new congressman from New Jersey, who's, I, I'm not sure about him yet, and he used to work at the State Department, but he said, and, but he comes from, family comes from Poland, and he's committed to human rights, and he said, what country in the history of the world has ever stopped its citizens from fleeing the, that government and repression? And US dollars, that's the border security money, is paying for that. So that's one chunk of it that is very straightforward in my opinion. Another chunk of it, and now here we get into what is so-called soft power. And you want to wonder, think about why did the generals say we have another prominent general, protecting the punk said Trump like a year ago said, well, don't cut the soft power or else we have to use the guns. So why is it called soft power? And this includes things that look really good that are either not helpful or um, problematic. One is violence prevention programs. And these are supposed called community-based policing projects fighting gangs. But we're working with the police that are killing people. Even in the model neighborhood that the State Department will talk about, uh, called Rivera Hernandez, which I know a lot about, um, they keep having to cut off the money for the U.S. project legal, but by law because there are ex extrajudicial killings by the very police we're supposedly working with. And in October, uh, the police, the military police in Rivera Hernandez shot up a van in which a man was driving his 14-year-old daughter pregnant to the hospital who was having problems. And the police, sh claiming they were a gang, shot up three kids that were in this van with their father taking their daughter to the hospital. These are the police that we're working with, and they're still engaged in all this extortion and stuff that I talked about before, and I, I know people that live in that area. Another piece of it is so-called judicial reform, $28 million. And you know, I know judges that do these kind of trainings, they say, well, if the judges, most of the judiciary is corrupt and tied in with drug traffickers and organized crime, you can send them to a workshop on how to keep better records or how to be more honest, and they're just gonna have a nice day at the embassy and laugh all the way to the bank, right? And remember that the attorney general is corrupt and sitting on the evidence. The attorney general is illegally appointed, and the president of the Supreme Court is himself a very tight with the president and is ruling in all these cases, okay? So you want to also see what does it mean to spend 23, 8 million on judicial reform in that context. And then there's this other thing which I'm always trying to figure out, $23 million to quote unquote good governance. You know, I go to Washington, I'm trying to figure out what do these things mean. Okay, good governance. Okay, we're gonna teach them about how to govern better down there. What does that mean if we recognize the outcome of a legal election? What does it mean if we recognize the overthrow of the Supreme Court? What does it mean if we tweet welcoming the legally named uh, Attorney General and then say, we're gonna go down and teach them good governance? I'm kind of a rage about this the last couple days because it's arrogance of US imperialism that Honduran people don't have their own notions of democracy and good governments that they've been trying to implement for hundreds for 500 years um, and you know and so and there's also something sometimes they'll talk about capacity building and capacity building is like well help them investigate crimes better that kind of thing but there's but then the crimes get 
they investigated, and for example, uh, there's the, the, the model police investigatory unit called ATIC, A-T-I-C, was gonna be the really good one, helping investigate Bertuck's case, et cetera, et cetera. And about, I guess, last spring, a uh, regional director was killed, a woman, and um, the evidence points to another regional director that may have been her boyfriend, and the um, ATIC says, we have to investigate this, it was a suicide. And the med chief medical examiner for the government said, has said repeatedly it was not a suicide and rattles off all the evidence that it was not a suicide and the attorney general fired her, okay, because of this. So what does it mean to train them in better investigations in this context, okay? And this, this is the money what people will say, watch in the papers, that this is what we need to keep funding. Finally, there's some stuff that probably is okay. Small business development, um, education, but what does it mean to do small business development or microcredit if the gangs working with the police that U.S. funding and celebrating are extorting those people out of existence, right? Right. So what does it mean to have small business development in that context? And then there's stuff that goes to agricultural, increase in agricultural productivity. And Erin, where are you, Erin? Here, she knows in the back, can talk to you about what these projects mean in Guatemala. And, and we're still trying to unpack where all this money goes. And then there's the last, if you want to say, the most benevolent parts. And one, is, one of them is $3.75 million to the Human Rights Protection Office within the government, which is in protest of so many human rights benders being assassinated or threatened or being in exile. The government set up this Human Rights Protection Office, which is pretty much worthless. Either they don't show up or they don't follow up on the evidence, or they send a cop to come around and look at your house and tell you their day, you're there, make sure you're still alive every day at five o'clock, which makes all your neighbors think that you're working with the corrupt cops. And I know people that have this, that have gotten death threats, trade unionists, now in exile in, in the United States. So what is that, where is that money even going to? You know, the last example, um, um, and then I'll end, is, um, if, man, how many, I know people saw a big giant spread in the New York Times this last Sunday that was about repression of women and feminicides in an area called Chaloma, which is part of the greater San Pedro Sula area, which is where the para factories are. And the author of that piece is a woman named Sonia Nasario who wrote a beautiful book called Enrique's Journey of, of 20 years ago about a young boy traveling from Honduras on the train to the United States. And that has she claims being an expert on Honduras ever since then. When the Berta Cáceres Act was first introduced in 2016, a few weeks later she had a giant spread just like this in the New York Times that was entitled, Who Says the U.S. Isn't Helping Things Get Better in Honduras? All about Rivera Hernandez, that neighborhood, the model neighborhood, all about USAID, um, was doing all this good in Honduras to clean up the cops with this project, um, even admitting that, um, that, they, that they had had to stop the money for a while because the police were killing people. And that project has never been proven to be effective. Um, and, um, and, the, and the article actually said this shows that USAID money is doing good and that we should not pass the Berta Caceres Act. Okay. There was so much outrage about that piece being so bodily propaganda for the State Department that actually I got an op-ed in the New York Times in a month later and I thought, gee, why did they take me? And it turns out there had been so much pushback. Okay, not coincidentally, 10 days after the act was just reintroduced, but it also could be in response to what Trump did, she has a new piece all about Shaloma. And in many ways, it's, it opens with that whole case of the Atik woman being assassinated that I just told you about, the suicide that was not a suicide, but it never says that Atik was funded by the United States, right? And, the, and it's all a story of unrelenting horror except for one women's project funded by the United States government, the USAID. So you have this huge suffering, beautiful suffering, beautifully written suffering victim story. The only bright light is a US funded isolated project when there are 40,000, 50,000 newly organized women Maculadora factory workers doing in that area as we speak, with beautiful women's develop, uh, leadership development projects going on. And I wrote a book about this stuff. I know these people well. When there is a whole beautiful movement against domestic violence that's been going on for 30 years in that region. When, there, when there's a beautiful women's resistance network. But these are people are part of the broader opposition, and they work with each other, right? And they are not one isolated little project funded by the United States. They're funded from people all over the world and all by themselves, but they have a, one, a beautiful, broad, coalitional understanding of women's work and empowerment that is including empowerment. It's not just a little victim story. And so instead, we get this story saying, 
that where, where one tiny little benevolent project in that neighborhood stands in for all US aid that of course we wouldn't want to cut and the m police that are in that story and the president in that story supported by the United States government disappear from the narrative of what the US is doing in Central America. So let me just act ask there, you know, the one thing you can do is support your Congress members and say thank you, please, and please get other members of Congress on. Obviously, you don't have to do this. It's just me talking. Please, please push around Jeff Merkley, who has been like sniffing around, maybe, sponsoring Berta Castro's act. And unfortunately, and again, this is the stampede because of Trump, Senator Bob Menendez, who's a, a ranking Cuban-American right winger, ranking Democrat on foreign relations, did a letter saying, um, support all the money, and included this line. And Merkley signed this, so did all the other liberals, but Leahy did not, to his credit. And this is the letter included this line, by obstructing the use of national security funding and seeking to terminate similar funding from 2017, you are personally undermining efforts to promote U.S. national security and economic prosperity. Okay? Now that's a direct pushback against about the Berta Caceres Act, and it's attacking Trump, criticizing Trump for, for holding back, not the good, what we might even think of maybe as the good money, but the, the security money to the Honduran forces. And shame on Jeff Merkley for signing that, and he knows better. So please push back and ask him to be heroic on this. He can be. I've met with him, but he should never have signed that. Um, so thank you very much. And